pharmaceuticals, generics, or secretagogues? And the easy answer to that is, it depends. It highly depends on your individual finances, your sourcing abilities, the expected results, and the accompanying side effects. If you're after an equivalent of two to three AUs growth hormone and you're young and you only know gray area peptide websites or your US-based compounding pharmacy doesn't really care about article 503A and B in which the United States Food and Drug Administration limited prescription of growth hormone secretagogues, then I would go with exactly that. Even though depending on the stack of growth hormone secretagogues that you're going with, two to three IUs of Chinese generics might be considerably cheaper. But if you're going after higher dosages, you know, the bodybuilder dosages, then I would stick with pharmaceutical grade growth hormone as that's exactly what it's been designed for. HIV positive patients use up to 18 IUs growth hormone daily and the side effects, depending on the pharmaceutical brand and the administration routes, appear to be quite tolerable. Let me explain. So let's start with pharmaceutical grade growth hormone first, as it's my favorite. And most bodybuilders salivate at the idea of running pharmaceutical while we cringe at secretagogues. And we reluctantly use generics during the off season so we can save a little bit of money for upcoming contest prep or cutting phase in which we run pharmaceutical grade GH instead. So what makes pharmaceutical grade a pharmaceutical? First, it's a Food and Drug Administration's approval or an equivalent medical regulatory agency, which is country specific for medical usage in the country of manufacturing and for medical application in other countries in which the growth hormone is exported to. Growth hormone manufacturers are subject to quality control, governmental oversights, World Health Organization standardization, third-party testing, and the full hand of the law through class action lawsuits in case they mess up during production, which happens occasionally, don't get me wrong. And all things considering, I would say that pharmaceutical grade growth hormone has the highest potency, the highest purity, the best product consistency, and overall the best quality, which is also what you're paying for, right? You're not only paying for the quality, but also for brand recognition. And since these products are meant to be prescribed in cases of growth hormone deficiency, HIV positive patients, muscle wasting diseases, Turner syndrome, or other short stature conditions, that means you're also paying for the middleman who somehow, some way, got you this growth hormone out of the regular medical supply chain into your hands. And by the way, exogenous growth hormone for anti-aging purposes, that's considered an off-label prescription. The World Health Organization standardized growth hormone dosages into international units, abbreviated to IU, where 0.33 milligrams equals one IU growth hormone and one milligram equals three IUs of growth hormone. Nowadays, pharmaceutical growth hormone is presented in either vials containing lifeless pucks or pens or cartridges with pre-mixed reconstituted growth hormone that is surprisingly stable at room temperature and even during international transport by post. But let's not go there in this video. Growth hormone on prescription might cost anywhere between $12 up to $25 per one international unit, but the insurance company might cover part of the cost or cover it fully. And on the black market, pharmaceutical growth hormone outside of the regular medical supply chain might cost anywhere between $3.5 up to $12 per one international unit. It seems that the average price across most brands and product formulations is about $6 per unit, but I would say that the fair value for pharmaceutical grade growth hormone is between $4 to $5 per unit. Here's a complete list of all the pharmaceutical growth hormone manufacturers, their brands, and the different products which they have available. It's a pretty extensive list. Most of, most of these aren't really available. Nordytropin is available, Omnitrope, Sizen, Humatrope, Serostim, Genotropin, and then maybe occasionally you can find a source containing Sinotropin or Gintropin or some of the other ones which are on the screen, right? It highly depends on where you live, obviously, because these might be FDA approved in particular countries and might not exactly export or export extensively. Now, what separates Chinese generics or Indian generics from Western made pharmaceutical grade growth hormone, first of all, is governmental oversight, third party testing, overall standardized quality adherence and quality control. And it seems that the generic manufacturers basically adjust potency, purity and IU content of the growth hormone vials based on the specifications of the purchaser. So if you have a source that sells Chinese generics and they want four IUs of growth hormone in a vial that labels it 
as 10 IUs, then that's what you're getting. You're not getting 10 IUs, you're getting four IUs. So basically with Chinese or Indian generics, you never really know what you're getting and you might have to test batch to batch to assure that you're getting what you pay for. I mean, generics might be underdosed, have subpar purity, might contain other peptides or compounds which result in undesirable side effects like water retention or injection site irritation. Uh, some generics might even contain a small amount of a diuretic like Monitol, for example, while other generics might contain antidiuretic hormone and really make you bloated as f And thus uh, the inexperienced among us might assume that this increased bloat is actually caused by a very high potency impurity growth hormone, where in reality it's just water retention, your blood pressure is increasing, and you're not getting any anabolism out of it. And it might even be relabeled human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, but it's easily determined with a pregnancy test, where you test positive, congratulations, you're pregnant, and your growth hormone is not growth hormone. It might be relabeled growth hormone releasing peptide two or six, making you incredibly hungry or another growth hormone secreted gog, increasing prolactin levels and cortisol levels. It might even give you facial flushing. But to be fair, nowadays, that isn't much of an issue anymore. The quality of Chinese made or Indian made generics has improved a lot over the years, where depending on the brand, the potency and the purity might actually be on par with Western made FDA approved pharmaceutical grades growth hormone at a significantly lower cost. So what do we need to pay attention to when we go with Chinese or Indian made generics? Does the vial have a vacuum? Because if there's no vacuum with a fancy branded logo on top, it means that the source, the manufacturer, took a yellow top or blue top or black top or red top, whatever the discrepancy between the potency and the purity is amongst all of those tops, they took the top off and put their own fancy branded top on the vial which ultimately makes it lose its vacuum. So that means some bacteria or other contaminants could end up in the lifelized puck. So if the vial has a fancy, fancy branded top, but no vacuum, um, it's probably contaminated, right? Or there's a very high chance of it being contaminated and the growth hormone might denature as soon as you reconstitute it. Once you reconstitute the generic growth hormone and the solution turns cloudy, that means that the peptides have now been denatured and the amino acid structure is either unfolded or broken apart into smaller peptides. When you read the medical insert of pharmaceutical growth hormone, Increlex, IGF-1, insulin, or other peptides, it specifically mentions not to inject cloudy solution because you might have an adverse reaction. This is now formally known as growth hormone, not exact, the exact same amino acid sequence of bioidentical growth hormone, right? Keep this in mind. If the solution turns cloudy on your generic GH, just throw it in the trash. It could be caused by temperature fluctuations where they store the growth hormone in some sort of hot warehouse, and then it goes into the airplane by post where it almost freezes, and then it ends up in the post office in a hot climate, in a hot warehouse again, and then it finally ends up in your fridge. And the same goes for premixed, reconstituted generics presented in fancy pens, which seems to be all the hype nowadays. If those arrive cloudy, just throw it in the bin. It's no longer growth hormone. But if there's a vacuum and the solution is clear, proceed with caution still. Inject one IU or two IU of this generic growth hormone subcutaneously to see if you get an adverse reaction. Is there any redness at the injection site? Any post-injection pain, right? Try this for a couple days before you decide to go intramuscular. Um, do a couple trial runs to see how you respond to this generic GH, send it over for third-party testing at a company like Janoshik. If it ends up being a purity of over 97%, then it's probably good to go. And it doesn't mean that a purity of 96% or 95% is considerably worse, but what are you getting for those other three to 5%, right? Are those binders, are those antidiuretic hormones or diuretics like Manitol making you lose all the water retention that growth hormone can potentiate? We're not entirely sure because third-party testing doesn't determine what the binders or the other preservatives or diuretics or uh, antidiuretic hormones might be. They only check how much growth hormone is contained within the lifeless puck or the pre-mixed cartridge or pen. And then lastly, you can do a serum growth hormone test either through intramuscular administration or even intravenous administration, albeit that that's not for the faint of heart. You could do 10 IUs intramuscular, let's say two to three hours before checking serum growth hormone levels. 
after which serum growth hormone should be at least over 20 nanograms per milliliter, but ideally within a three hour window, it should be over 30 nanograms per milliliter on a 10 IU administration. And if you go with IV, the dose can be significantly lower at let's say two IUs growth hormone intravenously, since circulating growth hormone levels have a half-life of about 20 to 30 minutes, you need to check serum growth hormone levels within five minutes. I think five minutes is the best time because that allows for your blood circulation to end up with a homogenized growth hormone concentrations, but not enough time for this exogenous growth hormone to metabolize in the bloodstream. So you IV2, I use growth hormone, and then you check serum growth hormone levels about five minutes later, after which serum growth hormone levels should be at least 80 nanograms per milliliter, but in many cases it's undetectable over 100 nanograms per milliliter.